Okay, so today we're going to talk about local area networks, uh, which includes enterprise networks. And basically where we are, we are basically at the link layer. So everything that we're not going to talk about today is at the link layer, and mainly what we'll see things regarding Ethernet. So I won't have time to, uh, to cover Wi-Fi. We can do that in our master degree. But uh, yes, everything that is related to Ethernet. So we already know the format of an Ethernet uh, frame. So what we'll see, so there are much more regarding Ethernet. So what we're going to see is first understand uh, what type of topology do we have, because the topology is really important to understand how things are working at the link layer. Uh, and understand that one of the main issues here is how do you access the medium? It, it, it's a large topic. Then we want to understand that local area networks moved from one segment to star topologies using uh, devices here that interconnect multiple links segments. So either we're going to see the bridges or the switches. Uh, then we will try to understand that um, what is a collision and what could be the problem when we have collisions and see a bunch of protocols and mechanisms which are very specific to local area networks. So we have a lot of cover. So if we just try to understand where we've been now, okay? So we already covered what is here in pink. So we know how to connect routers together. Uh, that would provide us with a domain, a routing domain, whatever you want to call it, within which we do routing, but we need to have addresses, uh, we need to configure uh, the routers, the IPs, and so on. And at the end, what we do, we do shortest path routing between end hosts. But the question now, given that you are connected to the internet through a gateway, the question now is to see, okay, so how do we call, connect the host to those routers? So do we have a kind of a spike here like this? You can see that this is not feasible. Why? Because you need too many wires and the router will, will exceed the number of ports, all right? So basically what we have here, this is what we call the LANs, the local area networks. And when they are wired, we're using Ethernet uh, architectures, okay? And as you may see, there's a bunch, of, a bunch of things that are happening here, all right? So let's get into this. So to understand how we organize inside each of the subnets that are connected to our domain, we need to understand that there are roughly two types of topologies, right? So either we have point-to-point -point networks, which means that, as you may see on the left here, you connect two devices, and so the link connect only devices two per two. But as you may see in this problem here, what we have is the fact that if I need to connect to somebody else, I need to go through intermediate host, who need to do some kind of routing stuff. So usually these kind of point-to-point -point networks are more suitable when you need to connect wide area networks on the long distance. And mostly what you have here, those would be routed. If you are on a local area, such as a campus, any kind of organization, usually what we use is something that we call share mediums. So what do we mean by share? We have one wire which can be either a bus, this is what I have here, or could be also uh, through the use of access point. And everybody share the same medium. So when we have Wi-Fi, we share the air. And the signal will propagate in all directions using the air. But the same happened when we have a bus. We already said that if I do one transmission, everybody can listen to the signal. It's pretty much the same here when I call, talk in a class. Everybody can hear me. I cannot prevent anybody inside the same classroom from listening. Why? Because my voice is using the air. But one of the problems that we're going to have, we need to implement what we call the medium access control. Why? Because the same way when I'm talking, if we start talking all together, we can understand each other. It means that our voices, our messages collide together, and basically it won't be understandable. So if we share the same medium, 
we need to make sure that we control who can access the, the, the medium, giving at, some, at one instant, one device, one node should only be the one transmitting. So how can you make sure that actually you can organize the devices in such that actually they can take turns in transmitting? So this is the purpose of medium access control. And look at that. Can you give me the, the, the first letters of medium access control? What is it? What is um, the acronym? MAC. So you know, all, all during all those chapters, right, we talked about MAC addresses, MAC blah, 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 MAC this, MAC that. Well, it's nothing more than the fact that when you do Ethernet, Ethernet is just a way of controlling who have access to the medium. So why is it important to have such a kind of architecture where we share the medium? Because you remember that in any IP subnet, you remember that the local services, they include ARC and DHCP. And those are heavily based in broadcast. So doing broadcast on the share medium is very simple. I send one message, everybody can hear it. Should I send a thousand copies because there's a, a, a thousand devices? No need. I just send one message, everybody gonna receive it. So that is very straightforward. And that's why this kind of medium is the best friend of IP because IP heavily rely on broadcast, okay? All right, so point to point, sorry, that, that came too late. So point to point and natural broadcast networks where actually you share a medium. Okay, so, but one of the problems, as I said, you know, so when we have a share medium, you can see here, you have two communications. And of course, if we uh, transmit at the same time, they're gonna be a collision. Okay, why? Because we are sharing the same medium. So basically that's the reason in those networks at the link layer, we implement the medium access control, which is just an algorithm that's gonna share the medium, right? By determine, determining which node can transmit at a given time, right? So we will see that basically uh, you need to be fair because if we are competing to access a medium, we want to be fair to everybody. So it means that everybody have the same chance, the same likelihood of transmitting. So this is also another requirement on this kind of, uh, of, um, of algorithms, okay? So what is important as well is to understand that, as I explained in the beginning, Ethernet used to be buses, but lately what happened is we move to other type of architecture, which are stars. So this is a kind of a star here. And to explain why did we move from a basic wire to something that is more of a star, is because this, the distance is limited. So it means that if you need to cover very large areas, the segment is not long enough because you cannot have like hundreds of kilo kilometers. So we were limiting. And what is more, the number of machines here, you cannot exceed a, a, a number of machines. All right, so that was impossible. So that's the reason people say that, okay, at some point, well, maybe it's better to interconnect multiple devices, multiple stars together, as you can extend the scope, the spoon of your network, and connecting more, uh, more devices in a scalable way. All right. But it's not because I'm using a star that actually I don't have the problem of the collision. The collision is still here. Because let's say, if I have a star here, and you see when I transmit, I transmit everywhere because I need to broadcast. If anybody else is transmitting at the same time, I have a collision again. So you see, so it's not because I'm on the bus that actually collision may arise. So the most important is to see that the logical topology is the most important, which means that I send a message, who gonna receive it, okay? So it's not about just the physical wire, it's about how the information is basically flowing in my network, all right? Because I need to know in which cases can a collision arise, then avoid it. So the medium access controls, so those are algorithms and there are multiple ones. I mean, since the beginning of uh, networking, like in the 60s, a lot of architecture have been proposed, okay? And uh, at the beginning, those were like specific to IBM, HP, and so on. So those companies, 
came with the hardware plus the software with those algorithms. Okay. And lately, we're starting having more popular uh, architectures. Um, we may classify them according to either they are static or dynamic. So what do we mean by static? A very simple example, what we can do in the classroom is to say that, OK, everybody can speak five minutes. And I give an order with a number for each student. And one by one, you're going to take turns. And you're going to be allocated five minutes where you're going to speak. Once your five minutes are up, we move to the next student in the same sequence. And we're doing rounds like this. So this is totally static. And nobody, and there's no collisions. But is there anything wrong with it? I mean, do you think it's efficient to uh, divide it in, in time slots like this? What can arise in that case, for instance? I mean, that is not very efficient because you see at some point, maybe a student had nothing to say, no question, no comments, and still we need to wait for five minutes. So for five minutes, I'm not gonna use a medium and skipping is really hard. So you see the static is not very, um, yes, exactly, Thomas. So that's the reason it's not very. So the best for computer networking, data networks, is to do something that is dynamic. But dynamic, now we have an issue, which means that I need first to know what are the needs, and according to those needs, give the hand to each user in a given order. So how can I basically, uh, tell in advance who has something to say. So yes, you may raise the hand, but it means that I need to query each of you, organize then the communication, such as it's fair at the end. So that is not also very obvious how to do it. And basically you have a latency where I need to poll everybody asking, okay, do you have anything to say? All right, well, you, 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 five, okay, we have one hour. Okay, so 20 minutes, each of you or whatever. I don't, do how, I don't know how to do the math. So that is static, we already said, dynamic. So dynamic is a determin deterministic one. So it means that knowing who, ha who wants to speak, I'm going to give the turn. Well, guess what? In Ethernet and Wi-Fi, which are the most popular one, we do something even more clever, which means that it's totally random. So be careful. It doesn't mean that it's 100% efficient, but it's very light. It's very easy to implement. And you need to understand that those algorithms were introduced back in the 70s, where a computer didn't have a lot of CPU, didn't have a lot of memory. So you couldn't expect some very high level processing. So you needed to do things quite easy. And Ethernet did something so easy that actually it was cheap and easy to implement on any existing computer at that time. And nowadays, we do exactly the same. So it means that in the last 30 or 40 years, it haven't changed. Just like IP. So you see, so the simple ideas are hard to remove, right? Anyway, so what is used by Ethernet is what we call the CSMI CD. So it's just the name of the algorithm. Okay, so it's a very tough word, but it's just the algorithm. And the principle is quite simple. So given that the CD means collision detection, collision detection, so it means that can we avoid the collisions? No, but we can detect them. And the CSMA means that you're going to sense the carrier, carrier sense, multiple access. And it's very simple. So there are three basic bricks here. You listen. So first of all, I want to speak. Let me check if somebody is currently transmitting. Nobody? OK, let me try. I'm starting. But well, what can happen? Maybe we start together at the same time. And then we realize that, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. So what do we do usually? Let's say we, we, we talk and we speak together and we overlap each other. What is the, the normal behavior within human beings, what do we do in that case? Okay, we may say sorry, all right, and then we wait, we do sign, please go, and then we restart and we retry, hoping that it's not gonna happen in the future. 
And usually it doesn't happen in the future because we're not a robot. So it means that somebody will try right away. Somebody else will wait one second and then won't interrupt the other. So that's why we wait. And wait a minute here. So it means that we talk together. Okay, there's a collision. We need to wait. But this is where we're going to do a random stuff. So I'm going to use a random function asking the devices to wait for a random period, which means that since it's random, out of the two random values, there's one guy with the shortest value. So he's a winner. But it's random. So it means that he's not going to be the, win the, the, the winner every time. So it's very simple. I listen. I try. If I win, good. If somebody else tries at the same time, ooh, collision. So then let's wait. Random. So you see, random don't need to be centralized. Because since it's random, I can expect that actually nobody needs to tell me, you wait one second, you three seconds to make it work. Because of random, it means that we won't have any overlap. So you see, so randomness in distributed systems is a very simple way to avoid centralization, which is very heavy because it requires a server, it needs to be always on, and so on, and so on, all right? Anyway, so this is what we do. Carrier sends, so I'm listening, and I detect the collision. And one of the main things is to understand as well, but how can I know that there's a collision? So in this class, for instance, so I cannot see most of you, I can only see Adrien, but how can I know without watching your mouth, your lips moving, how can I know that you talked at the same time with me? It's very basic. How can I know? Because I listen, and I can realize that what I listen to is not my voice, it's a mix of multiple voices. So I compare what I transmit with what I'm receiving. And I know the collision arised. And this is exactly what we did in Ethernet. So you see, so it's a very basic one. So let's get into a little bit more of the details. So let's say you have three devices here. They're on the bus, whatever. And here, you remember, we have the transmission. You transmit the message. So this is TT. And the TT means that each of the bits of your message are, are propagated as a signal here. So here is my TP. Propagation time transmission, OK? Everybody understand this? So this is the length of my message. And if I know my throughput, I know how much time it takes to transform those bits into a signal and propagate it, right? And you may see, you remember that there's a pipeline in here where transforming the bits in a signal, I can propagate the signal while transmitting the other bits. All right, you understand this, uh, this shape? And so let's say at some point, and maybe, maybe what I can do, I can do like a, a fake one first. So I have A, I have B. A going to send a very small message. Here is my transmitting. And B wants to transmit two. Here. Is there a collision? Do we have a collision here? Yes, we have a collision, right? They cross each other. So the signal will be overlapped and scrambled. Can you tell me if A, B, or C can detect the collision? Yes or no? It's a yes or no answer. So please go to the chat and put a Y for yes and a no. Or maybe yeah, put who knows about the collision? Can anybody tell me who knows about the collision? We said that in order to be able to detect there's a collision, I need to be listening while transmitting. And if I'm transmitting something that is not consistent with what I'm listening to, it doesn't work. So here, am I transmitting or did I, did I finish transmitting? Uh, wait a minute. Here, you see, this is a transmission, so I'm done. The message has been sent, okay? This one too, I'm finished transmitting. So here, I'm just receiving. Do I have any way to compare this signal with the one that I was transmitting? I finished transmitting. There's no way I can compare what happened in the past. You see what I mean? So it's too late. So it means that there, no way that I can detect the collision. The only way to detect the collision is if, if I can compare what I'm transmitting with what I'm receiving. So it means that what should I do with this size? I need to make it bigger. Understood? And the same with the green. So now if I make it bigger, you can see that here I'm transmitting. And now I'm receiving the signal that result of the collision. Now I know that there's a collision. 
So back to the normal slide. So here there's a transmission, B start transmitting, and you see that at this point when B wanted to transmit, was it idle? Yes, he did. He couldn't hear the transmission yet. So before even receiving A, he said, okay, it's idle. Nobody's using the medium. Let me transmit. So he started transmitting. And you may, you may see that now the collision that happened here is detected here and is detected here. Because B and A can compare what they're transmitting with what they're receiving. And you can see that here to make sure that A can know about the, the, the detection. Look, you need to have a message that is long enough, such as you may be sure that if a collision happened, you are still transmitting, such as you can detect that as a collision. And the condition here is you may see that this is 2TP, 1TP, 2TP. And your transmission should be long enough. And that's the reason if, you, uh, if we look at the uh, specification of Ethernet, a frame, an Ethernet frame have a minimal size of 64 bytes. Why? Because otherwise, I wouldn't be able to detect the collision. Is that OK with everybody? Pretty simple. I know it's hard to understand the propagation because when we speak, we don't really realize. But go to the mountains and start shouting your name uh, the guy on the other peak, right, will listen to your name uh, a few seconds later, you know? So you need to think about the propagation this way, right? Okay. Okay, so the last question is, what about C, guys? So was C transmitting? Was, was C transmitting? No. So can he knows about the collision? Because we said collision only if I can compare my transmission with what I'm receiving. C is not transmitting, so can he be informed that there's a collision? No, too bad for this guy. So that's the reason what we did. We added as well a special uh, uh, signal that whenever whoever detects that there's a collision, okay, I'm gonna start sending a very specific sequence of bits, zero and ones, that we call the jam sequence, that is intended to inform everybody else who was not involved in the transmission that the collision happened and you better stop listening to the signal. Because you may see that here, I'm listening to the signal and somebody needs to tell me that, oh, don't bother because it's meaningless, okay? It's, it's totally, it's scrambled. So probably this, the result of signal, is, you won't be able to understand it. So that's the reason I'm sending the jump sequence, all right? Do you understand why the jump sequence is for C to be able to detect the collision as well? So this is how Ethernet is working. So let's go with, uh, again, the different phases. First, I need to transmit, I listen. If it's busy, too bad, I need to wait. So I wait. You see, is it finished talking? So how can I make sure that actually it's gonna be idle? Because the size of a, of, of a frame, you remember, have a maximal size, hopefully. Otherwise, I could be waiting for a very long message. So hopefully the frames are like 15, you remember 1500 something bytes. So we have a limited. So I wait. So when it becomes idle, up, I'm gonna start transmitting right away. And while transmitting, I need to compare what I'm transmitting with what I'm receiving, in that case, I go to number two. Otherwise, if there's no collision, yeah, I'm happy and I succeeded. All right, so if a collision happened, I stop, I send the champ sequence, I have a reduced transmission counter, okay? I will basically uh, randomly take some kind of random backup period, okay? And then I will wait for that period before going back to waiting until it's busy or idle, and so on and so on. So the counter here, we have a counter because if I try over 15 times and I, a collision happened, at the 16th time, I give up. So anyway, so I try, and after 16 times, if I collide, collision, 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 I give up, all right? Something is wrong. So you see, so this is pretty simple. So the exponential backup, as I explained, this is a random value that I select, and I let you read this, but the most interesting thing is 
I have an interval of values, right, that I'm using. And in case of multiple collision, I'm going to increase that interval more and more and more and more. So you see, if I'm doing this, is because if I have multiple collisions, it means that the network is heavy loaded. And so it means that the more it's loaded, the more I should slow down a little, you know, don't try right away, wait for longer. So that's why I'm increasing the possible values, since it means that a lot of devices try to transmit. So adding more random values that you can pick randomly will add more likelihood of selecting different values and longer values. Okay, so that's the reason instead of putting fire uh, oil on the fire, right, making things worse, I wait longer. Okay, so just to finish on this, this is the Ethernet frame. You know this by uh, from now. We have the destination source this, uh, address, the type, the data, which is limited, a minimal size, and a maximal size. You remember, this is a so called MTU. But now we have also a minimal size. And you may see that, for instance, if here I have an IP packet with a TCP header with no option, what is the size here? IP, TCP, no option. OK, so it's 40. And you see that we say the maximal size is 46. So we need to add padding. OK, so this is one of the cases where you will need some padding. Anyway, and uh, we didn't talk about it, but at the end, we have a CRC which is actually a kind of a checksum, but it's much more reliable and robust than the checksum. So it's two bytes, uh, two bytes, yeah, why did I put a, uh, yeah, two bytes, that's good. And here there's a preamble, we never talked about the preamble, it's something that is actually a sequence of uh, bytes that will help me into adjusting and synchronizing with the start of the frame. So I'm start listening, I can see a sequence of bytes, and it tells me that, oh, wait a minute, the frame is starting soon. So it's just to uh, align with the beginning of the frame. It's not really useful. Another thing that is really interesting is here, basically, uh, whenever I'm done transmitting one frame, even if I have a second one, they tell me that I should always be silent. I shouldn't transmit two frames in a row back to back, why? Because I need to be fair. So if I did one transmission, I need to be silent. If anybody wants to uh, transmit, he can try to, right? So that's the reason I put a, sil a silence here. And basically the silence is also very useful in order to avoid your wire from melting. If you keep transmitting on the wire, uh, at some point it's gonna melt, right? So uh, you, you keep a small silence just to make it cool down. All right. So once again, so as we may see, so uh, at the link layer, so we already talked about uh, the uh, MAC and access plus the addresses. We know about this. The encapsulation with the header and the trailer that we add on top of the IP. We do the encoding, which means that the bits are converted to a signal that's going to be propagated. We do error correction. Oops, oh my God, sorry. Uh, we do with the CRC. So this is in order to detect the errors. But in Ethernet, we don't correct the errors. No way, we don't correct any errors. If there's a frame that is uh, with an error, we uh, just discard it. Hopefully there's TCP on the upper layer that's gonna do a transmission. And uh, we don't do flow control. So those are available in other architectures, but not Ethernet. Anyway, so we talked about the collision and you may understand that you see, the more you're going to add devices to your network, the, the more the likelihood of having a collision. So at some point, you better find a way to either limit the number of devices or to segment your network in multiple pieces, such as you can avoid the collisions. All right? And so that's the collision domain. And we have also the broadcast domain. So those are two separate things. So let's try to explain about those. So as I explained, so normally we have two buses here. And at some point, because the distance, the maximal distance, the length of the bus is limited, we start using repeaters in order to be able to extend the length by boosting the signal. So a repeater is something that connects two buses together 
And because the signal over a distance gonna melt, or gonna fade, I have the repeater in the middle and it's boosting the signal again, all right? So that was a very, uh, a very limiting technology, very basic. And at some point, real, the people realize that, yes, but if you add multiple buses and you add more and more devices, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have more and more collisions. And at some point, nobody can, can communicate anymore because whenever I try, there will always be a collision. And at the end, maybe 1% of the frame is going to be in success. Nice. Anyway, so mm, not good enough. So the people said, OK, instead of using the repeaters, we're going to replace this by a switch, OK? Or by what we call a bridge. So I will explain in the next slide. And those devices, they participate to the CSMA CD. So what it means, it means that if I receive a frame here and the destination is here, I'm not going to send it blindly on the other side. No, I'm going to check if it's idle. And if it's idle, I'm going to send in the other network. So as you may see, that one transmission from one side to another doesn't affect, doesn't create a collision. And what is more, if the destination was here, the switch will block the traffic. So you isolate the traffic. And what is more, you avoid the collision from happening if you ever need to send the traffic from one side to another, thanks to the CSMAC. So you see the switch is somehow a little bit more smart than a repeater. Okay, the repeater doesn't ask questions. I send the signal. Okay, so that's the reason here I have two collision domains. Because one transmission here doesn't mean that this transmission will overlap with another transmission in the other domain that is local. So you can have two transmissions at the same time. If the source and destination are not in the same domain, that doesn't could not create a, um, um, a collision. All right? Uh, but you have to be careful. Why? Because let's say if I send a frame here with FFF everywhere, because this is the FFF, so it means that it will go everywhere here, everywhere here. But here, before I send it to the next network, I try to avoid the collisions. But still, I can reach everybody else. Is this acceptable? So let's say this is the destination, and you have an app request for D. You want to know the MAC address of D. Will this request go inside here, yes or no? I cannot avoid, right? But should I? Yes, probably I should, but I cannot, right? So you have to be careful. So that's the reason here I introduce as well the broadcast domain. So it doesn't mean that because you avoid the collisions that actually you can broadcast within just one domain, okay? Broadcast will still go everywhere. And that may be a problem. And the problem is related to the fact that, yeah, sometimes you may don't want to uh, have your traffic goes everywhere. And what is more, you can understand that if we could find a way, if we could find a way of dividing this in two, what can you say about the arc table here? You have an arc table. If you compare the arc table here or the arc table that you have if you have this, what can you say about the size of the arc table? Which one is bigger, the green or the red? Green, yeah, you, you see? But still, we cannot prevent like this from happening. Yes, Alan. Yes, Eugene, this is a green one. OK. So you have to be careful. All right. So as we see, so we have a hub first, like a repeater. The hub is when you have a star. The repeater is when you have two buses. So it's pretty much the same. So either you connect two buses or you connect a star with links. So it's pretty much the same. In one case, this is a hub. This is a repeater, okay? And it doesn't do CSMA CD, okay? So somehow that brings problems because once again, it's not scalable because as you increase the number of devices or buses that you are connecting together, that's gonna create a lot of collisions. 
So it means that then more collisions mean you need to try longer, you try to wait longer, so it's going to introduce a lot of latency. And what is more, if you have one device that is actually acting in a weird way, it's going to affect all the network. So instead of using a hub or a repeater, we start using what we call the switches. And the main difference between a switch and a hub is the fact that now you're going to do CSMACD plus self-learning. And so let's try to understand what are those two technologies, right? The CSMACD, we already know. Before forwarding a frame, you're going to listen to check if it's idle on the other side to avoid a collision. Now, let's see about what is the self-learning, OK? And we'll see that some of the properties is those devices, those switches are totally transparent to the host. They don't even know there's a, there's, a, there's a switch. So that's good. It's plug and play, just power. That's it. It works. No configuration at all. So this is like kind of a miracle. We already said the router needs a lot of configuration. In the case of the switch, you plug, it works. So it's also very interesting because switches are mainly used in data centers. And what we can see in data centers, we have what we call racks, okay, with a bunch of servers. So here there's an S, I'm sorry. Okay, so you have piles of servers and they need to communicate together. To interconnect the servers, what you have, you have the TOR. TOR stands on top of the rack. On top of the rack, you're gonna have a switch. So this is in order to make the communication between two servers inside the same rack. And if you need to connect between two servers in different racks, you're going to have also here a backbone with switches that are very heavily connected, such as you can always find a way to reach one of the servers. So switches are very interesting, and they are used in a lot of data centers. OK? So they are not bad, right, even compared to a router. OK? So OK, so let's talk about the self-learning. OK, so we already said that. Let's say here we have A, and A needs to reach C. C is a destination. All right. So we already said that normally, if it was just a hub, it will send the message everywhere. The switch, before sending, will check, thanks to the CSMACD, if you are creating a collision. So that's OK with the collision. But what would be nice, right? Would it be nice to say that, but I don't need to send it here, neither here. It would be better just to send in on this only one. But now what you need at the switch is a table. So the question is, how can I populate the table of the switch? Such as in my switch, I may have as the info, A is plug on port I, B on port J, C on port K, and D on port L. How can I configure those entries? So what they did instead of routing, we do what we call the self-learning. And this is super interesting how they did it. So you don't need any protocol. No protocol at all. You don't introduce new messages. Look what we're doing. So when you receive the frame, so the frame is from A to C. So what can you learn through that frame? You can learn that A is located where? On interface I. So I'm going to create the entry. Do I know where is C? No, I don't know. So what am I going to do in that case? I'm going to broadcast everywhere. But thanks to the flouting here, in, in some way, yes, I did. In some way, yes. So you broadcast, but thanks to the broadcast, it means that if C exists, he will receive the message. Because if you flout, it should reach C at some point. And the good thing about reaching C, it means that you know we are in a network. You know, it's not like in Zoom, it means that if I send you a message, I expect what? In return, a response. So it means that when I create this entry, I create it by saying that, well, if I'm sending a message to A to C, probably, probably C gonna answer. And so what's gonna happen now? C gonna answer. And thanks to that answer, what, what am I going to realize that C is located where? On J. And so what about this message, the red one? Do I need to flout it? Or can I send it only on one interface? Flouting or one? Just one. 
I'm going to use that entry and send it to I. So you see how it works? So I'm just watching the frames without introducing new frames, just by checking where is located a device, adding an entry in the, what we call the CAM table, and then I'm good. So you see how I do that? The interesting thing also about this is the fact that when you create one entry, anyway, I don't know where, if I should, uh, yeah, well, uh, the, uh, you create it with the age. So it means that the entry is created for a limited period of time that need the entry to be refreshed. If the entry is not refreshed, which means that it's not used, you're going to flush the table. Why do you do that? You do it for at least two reasons. The first reason is you see that if you have a lot of devices, the table is going to start being very large and you want to keep it small. And basically what you want to do is in this table, you just want to maintain the active devices. Because most of the computers, usually they will go idle. So why should you keep one entry for devices which are totally idle? So that's the reason you flush, because at some point you say, well, I shouldn't keep the entry since nobody's interesting, interested in to communicate with anybody else. So you put the TTL. The other reason is maybe you know this is a laptop, and at some point you're going to move to another room. If you move, you're going to be plugged to another interface. Okay, So you need to update that information. So to update it, you put a TTL such as the entry going to be flushed, and you will need to renew the entry with a new port number. Understood? OK. So that is how you do a safe learning. OK? So you learn through flouting. So you see, so that's the reason I told you, even if you do broadcast, I mean, it's not because you have a switch you cannot broadcast. Broadcast is vital. So you need to broadcast to learn where is, where is the device. You need to broadcast to do IRP. You need broadcast to do DHCP. So having a switch doesn't mean that you don't broadcast. No. It means that sometimes you will need to do it, but not all the time. But what is for sure, you have no collisions, right? So for instance, if you receive um, a frame for a destination that you don't know, you flout. We already said about it. So basically, uh, I'm going to show you the final algorithm. So the algorithm implemented by a switch is super simple. Let's say I'm receiving a frame. I'm going to check if the MAC address of the destination is inside the table. If it's not, if it is in the table, you're going to check if the interface that is indicated is different from the incoming one. If it's the same, you're not going to use it. Otherwise, you're going to have a loop. So what you do here, you check the, inter the interface in the table. If it's different, then you're going to send in on this interface. If you cannot find any entry regarding that destination, what you do, you flout in order to discover where is the destination for the next time. OK, so very simple. So that is self-learning. Any questions? So if I compare the switches with the hub, so you may see that as an advantage over the hubs, is more scalable. Why? Because you extend the scope of the spawn of your network without actually increasing the number of collisions because the switch in the middle will divide your network in collision domains. Okay? It can avoid also some unnecessary traffic from flow going from one area to another because the switch may block, filter the traffic because the destination is not located in that domain. So you avoid the traffic from propagating everywhere, OK? So you uh, preserve the bandwidth. And that improves somehow the privacy. Because now when you communicate, your traffic doesn't go everywhere. So not everybody can listen to the traffic. Sometimes it may when you are in a learning phase, right? So you still need to flow the traffic. But some other times, it won't. So somehow, there's an improvement of the privacy. Of course, the disadvantage is you need to uh, avoid the collision. So it means that you need to wait. Listen, it's busy. I'm waiting. Uh, there's a collision. I need to retry. So that's going to increase a little the latency. Uh, even though nowadays what they do, they have two wires per port, one for sending, one for receiving, to make it more idle, more available. So um, you, you can also uh, either decide to uh, check at the switch if a frame is corrupted. So you may want to check the CRC. You remember at the end of the frame, at the switch. But in that case, it's going to delay things because you need to receive all the frame, check if it's in error, 
And if it's not, you can start forwarding, but you can even remove that feature and say to the switch, oh, you know something, you receive the destination, you know where to send the frame, please start forwarding without waiting for the trailer, okay, the end of the frame. Uh, you need a table, so obviously, well, even though it's self-managed, right? I mean, it still need memory, which is not the case of a hub. And obviously, because of self-learning tables, blah, blah, and so on, and CSMACD, the cost is higher for a switch. So this is one of the consequences. Okay, so as I said, you know, at the switch, you can either ask to buffer the whole frame, because as I said, when you have your frame, at the end, you have the CRC. So this is what helps you into determining if the, uh, the frame is in error. So maybe you will need to wait to receive all of it to check if there's an error. If you don't want to have this feature, you can set your switch, such as you can do cut through switching, which means that you see here, I wait until I receive the CRC to check if it's in error. Here, I just wait for the destination address. I check the table and I start forwarding the frame while receiving it. So it goes faster and no need for memory. So that's one of the ways to improve. Okay. One of the problems that we have also because of the switch, we said that the switch doesn't prevent broadcast. And what is more, you remember that in an Ethernet frame, there's no TTL. So it means that now we have two buses here. And those buses are connected by two bridges. You see that if you have such a connection, you need to fly out then your traffic will loop forever. It will loop without stopping. So you need to, wait to, to find a way to uh, avoid this problem. So first question is, why do you think someone would like to connect two buses using two devices here? Is it uh, on purpose or is it an accident? Well, this is on purpose. For what reason? We do it on purpose because it's more robust. So it means that if one switch is down, the other one is going to take over. So you make your network more robust. But in that case, if you want to make it more robust, you have a cycle. And because of the cycle, if you have broadcast to flouting, the traffic is going to loop forever. So in order to avoid this, so guys, when you have a graph and the graph, you remove the cycles in a graph, what is the resulting graph? A graph without a loop. What is the name of it? A tree. Yes. So the purpose is to say, so that's a very good answer from Ohau, Adrien, and uh, Gavin, of course. So the purpose is to say, okay, I don't like cycles. Let me build a tree. And so this is why in lands, you have to know about the spanning trees. Have you heard of the spanning trees and the STP protocol? That's super important. Why? Because as I said, switches may introduce cycles. If you have cycles, no TTI in your frame, and the fact that you still need to flout, there's no other way but to build a tree. So what is this? So here I have this graph with switches. I need to find a way to disable, I mean, logically, right? I don't think that you unplug the wires. No, you still need the wires, right? But you want to make sure that those here have been disabled. It means that I don't use them unless there's a topology change. So you build a tree. All right, so what does it mean having a tree? What is the first step into building a tree, guys? Yes, I need to elect the root. So here's my root. So usually what we do, we use the MAC addresses, so uh, switches have MAC addresses, and they will be used as the ID. So the switch with the lowest ID will be the one to be elected as a root. Once you know who is the root, you're going to build the branches. And to build the branches, we're going to select the branches as usual based on the distance. And here we're going to count the number of hops as usual. So you may see that this guy have multiple choices to reach the root. I'm going to use the shortest one which is one hop away, okay? And if there's a tie, what am I going to use as usual? I'm going to use the ID of the next hop, and I'm going to use a switch with the lowest ID. And guys, even more crazy now, if let's say there's a double connection here, I'm connected with two wires, 
how am I going to do in that case? Because I need only to use one of those wires. Which one am I going to use? Well, I'm going to go use the port ID because each port have an ID. So I'm going to use the ID of the port to use the smallest one. So you see, so there's always a way to, to uh, break the ties. Okay. Anyway, we're going to get, and what we'll see, uh, because that's the reason I have a lab on this, you may also do a setup manually by using a kind of a priority, which is going to increase the value of the ID of somebody as it may look bad. It won't have the lowest ID anymore by having a higher priority. So you can even influence the choices manually, but you don't need to, right? So that's the reason. It's plug and play. If you want to let the, it random and say, well, Whatever is the result, I'm, I'm glad with this. You put it on the power, works alone. Nothing, no configuration. A routing protocol, remember, doesn't work this way. Routing protocols, you need to configure the neighbors, let them know what is the IP addresses, blah, blah. Do I need to configure the MAC addresses? No, because when I buy the switches or anything with Ethernet, it comes with the MAC address provided by the manufacturer. So no configuration. So that's it. Okay. So in order to do the election, we're using specific messages. Well, they are called P BPDU, anyway, bridge protocol data units. Well, I don't want to get into the details. But the most interesting is when a switch X send the message. So what they're going to send, they say me X. I pretend that to my point of view, Y is a root. So I'm going to advertise who I think is a root and what is the distance in other hopes to reach that root. And everybody send this to their neighbors. Obviously. When you power up and you don't know anything about your neighbors, what is the first message that you're sending? Who can be the root if you know nobody else? Myself. So I'm going to start pretending that I know I can only be me because I don't know anybody else. So let's take an example. Okay. So I'll let you read the, the blah, blah. Anyway, so let's focus on this part here, on this uh, loop, which is here. Okay. Let's start from the beginning. So X. Uh, four, seven, and two, gonna send a special message. So the message from two at the beginning gonna be two zero two seven seven zero seven. Blue four zero four. So once I receive this message here, and this message. What's going to happen? What is the new message that I'm going to send instead of the blue one? Four, with know that two is the root because two have a lowest ID. And I have two choices. So either I go this way or I go one hop. Which one am I going to use, guys? One or two? One. So this is the message I'm going to send. Same with seven. Seven can choose between two, four, and seven. Which one is the lowest one? Can you tell me? Two, four, or seven, myself. Who is the, lo the lowest? Yeah, not one yet. It's going to come in the future, Gavin. So but let's focus on this small loop, and then we're going to extend it, right? It's propagating in the time. So now I'm going to say two, one, seven. Uh, no, my mail is the opposite. Seven things that two is the root with one. And so two, going to keep this message. So you may see that out of these messages, four will reach this one, seven going to reach this one, and this one have been disabled. When I say disabled, there's a TTL. So until two doesn't change, or there's no link trailer, this state, these interfaces will be disabled. They may be re-enabled in case there's a topology change, which means that I'm still sending the message for two, one, I'm still sending the message seven, two, but I don't send data. I'm not sending data. If at some point this one is down, for instance, what am I going to do? I'm going to start using that path. You understand why I have uh, disabled with a TTL just in case the topology will change. Of course, as Gavin said, yes, but at some point what's going to happen? Two going to receive two messages, this one from three and this one from six. So from six, what is the message from three? What is the message that I received from three? I agree. Three will receive with one hop because it's one hop away. What about six? So six is going to send one is, and what is the distance? So I have the choice between one, two, 
and one. So with one. So it means that now two have two choices. So either it goes through three, six with a distance of one. Which one am I going to use? There's the same distance. So I'm going to use what is the next criteria in order to select the path? We said the smallest ID. So it means that three is going to be the good one. So it means that this one is going to be disabled, the same way this one has been disabled. So it means that now two is going to update his message. And the message that two is going to send is one with a cost of how much? What is the new message that two is going to send to four and seven? With a distance of two. Very good answer. So you see, so it means that at the end, now what is the tree? This one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And what did we disable those interfaces on both ends? This one, oh, and I forgot the red here. Et voilà the, the tree. Very simple, you see, and that works perfectly. So a couple of questions before we move on. First question, do you think that tree is efficient? Yes or no? You still need to understand that for instance, if I need to, uh, if I'm four, and I need to send from S a destination which is here, what is the path that I'm going to follow? What is the path, please, guys? Give me the sequence of of switches that I'm going to follow. Uh, yes, 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 yes. But do you think that this is a better path than this one? No, it's not. So basically, my question is the following. Out of all those switches, which should be somehow another choice as a root? Which one should you choose? Yeah, two could be good. I agree with you, Alan. But now the new problem that we have is like you're going to have all the traffic will be concentrated on this guy. And that's going to be like a kind of a bottleneck. So it's good for the distance, but it's bad for the load. So there's always a criteria and you always need to have the trade-off. Anyway, but that's a very good answer. And if you want to do that choice, you have the priority setting. You can change the priority of the switches, such as to get with the lowest ID. Okay. All right. So I let you read. So this algorithm uh, must react to the failure. So it means that either the root node can fail or any other switch or link. And so that's the reason in order to uh, make it robust, it means that we need to uh, periodically send the messages over all the links to our neighbors. Uh, whatever states are created, including the disabled state for an interface, needs a TTL, which means that if it's not refreshed by the messages, it means that that interface should be re-enabled, all right? Because it means that I cannot reach a root anymore or the root have changed. So that's the reason we make it, uh, we make it robust by having TTLs when we disable uh, interface. And th such a state that actually depends on the TTL, we already talked, said that those are soft states, okay? All right, so as we may see, so the switch are automatically configured. No need for an IP address. The MAC address is still there, so they can do uh, quite easy things. The forwarding is very simple. Why? Because the table that I have is a table where I have a MAC address, and the MAC address is not aggregated. There's no prefix, no mask. So it means that I receive a frame, 48 bits, does it match? Yes? Good, I'm a winner. With the routers, you remember that you need to do LPM, and that's a problem. But the good thing with the, with the, with the routers is like you can do shortest path routing without using your tree. So it means that in the switches, it's fast, but you still have a path that depends on the route. So depending on the configuration of the route, your path may be not the optimal one. With a router, you can always take, take the shortest path between any pair of routers, which is not the case with the spanning tree. So there are some pros, some cons. Anyway, let's take a few minutes. And, 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 and did you see um, the, the purpose of the switch? Okay, meaning self-learning. We already said about it. The collision and so on. All right. But as you may see, Okay, if we go back to the very first slide that we had, which is here, you see that even if you have a switch, you see have the problem of privacy. And it means that if you send an FFF message, or I have a, if I send the FFF message, it's still gonna be received by everybody else. And not only the FFF, for any traffic that actually doesn't exist in my table, I still need to flout it. So can I say that my, my 
my uh, my traffic is uh, secure. Can I say that this is a hundred percent secured? Yes or no? No. You see, because if the table is empty, and even if the destination is here, and I'm trying to reach that destination, I still need to flout everywhere. Is it possible that you can see the traffic coming from another network? Yes, it is. All right? So that is a big problem. For some companies, it's a problem. So that's the reason the only way we have to do it goes as full. So let's take an example. So let's say I have this architecture here. So I have a switch connected to the internet with the router. So you may see her here is, is a mess. Traffic goes everywhere. Okay? It may be flouted. Sometimes it's not flouted, but sometimes it will. So if I don't trust another department, still they can snoop into my traffic. So bad. Anyway. So what I can do, I can still say that, oh, but be why? This is because switch is wrong, and you shouldn't be using a switch. So let's put routers, because you see the routers, do they need to propagate the traffic here? If the source is here and the destination is here, do you need to send it everywhere, everywhere else with a router? You don't need. So but why we don't want to use routers? Because routers cost money. And what is more, they need to be configured so you see, so it's a pain in the ass, not only because it's expensive, but also somebody needs to configure them. Huh. So is it an option having routers? No. So that's the reason that people thought about, okay, so what, what can we do? Let's try to find a way to divide those, the big domain that we had in multiple subdomains, broadcast domains. It means that the traffic will stay inside here. So we try to achieve the same result with having subnets, but this time by using one armed router, which means that, for instance, if I need to send the traffic from the green to the blue, I still can do this by sending to the router, and then the router will send it to the blue. So I still can do it by using the router to one interface. But now what we're going to do, to do this division, and that's why you're going to see that VLANs are totally stupid, yes, I'm going to create a table. And this table is going to be created manually. So what it means, I'm going to say to which VLAN each of the ports belong to. And so what it means to the switch, it means that whenever I receive some traffic on the port one, I can only send it to who? To the port nine and four. That's it. There's no other way, even if it's flouted, even if it's not in my table, whatever, the VLANs are going to block things. But if they block things, it's because somebody told the switch to do so. So it means that if you have 100 VLANs in your network, how many VLANs should your admin configure? 100, minorly. That's expensive, right? That is expensive. But this is the only way. But you see, at the end, what we did is like, is like we, all, we, all, we organized the computers together in the same domain virtually. Can I change this dynamically? I mean, this guy at some point, he used to be, I don't know, a PhD. Now he's been promoted as a associate assistant professor. He can move to that. Can I move him with his computer to another domain? Yes, I can. By doing what? By changing one of the ports. So I don't know which one it is, but anyway, by adding a new port here and saying that this port anymore is not in this VLAN which was the port two. Where is the port two? Uh, I, I, did, I, did I have the wrong port? No, this one, it was four. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, it's this one. It needs to be green now, but you do it manually. So basically what you need to have now in a switch is what we call a VLAN table. And the VLAN table will be a way to be able to tell to which VLAN the frame belongs. 
So you have easy way of doing this. So either you can do a static one, which means depending on the incoming port. So this frame is coming from that port. It means that it belongs to that VLAN. But that's very dangerous because I can plug my computer to that wire. And the only thing that it takes to belong to the VLAN is to plug to the right wire. So let's say my, my office is open. There's my Ethernet cable. Anybody can write, plug to the network, his computer, and start you know, snooping in the traffic. So that's the reason we don't do static, but we'd rather do the dynamic. And dynamic, we still need a table, but in that table, to know to which VLAN I belong, it's going to be based on my MAC address. So it means that they're going to look at the source MAC address, and they're going to say, oh, this guy belongs to this VLAN. This computer belongs to an associate professor. So he's a faculty. So he belongs to the VLANs of the faculty. So wherever I'm going to plug my computer on the network, because of the table on the switch, they're going to identify to which VLAN I belong to. Understood? So basically, it works this way. So let's say I have this table. For each VLAN, I know the list of MAC addresses that belong to each of those VLANs, the, one, the ones we are allowed it. So it means that once I'm plugged to the switch, depending on the traffic that I'm sending from one computer, the switch is going to look at the MAC address. You're going to say, oh, this is the MAC address. He belongs to that VLAN. So this traffic can only go on 9 and 4. That's it. But we'll still need to talk about something. We may have a problem when you have two switches together. What I, do I mean by that? So let's say I have this table here, right? And let's say at some point, you know, this table is indicating that on the port 5, I can receive traffic coming from two VLANs. You see that it may come from this guy. It may come from this guy. So it means that when I receive the frame, I can either, this port can be associated to the VLAN 1 or the VLAN 2. And so we have a problem because now you have two possible values. So how can I basically separate the frames now, given that now there's two VLANs? So in order to avoid this problem, what do we do between the two? We use a tag. So what we do, we change the format of the frames. You remember, destination, source, market address, and type. And we add here, before the type, we, we add those data here. And this one here includes the VID, which is the VLAN ID. So let's go back to what we have here. So I'm sending A sender traffic. And this switch, because of his table, can say that, oh, let me look at A. OK, so A have been received on the port 1. So if it's the port 1, it belongs to the VLAN 1. So it means that VLAN 1, you're going to add it to the frame. And now this switch is going to forward the frame to the right VLAN, depending on the VID inside the frame. So if I look at the table, what they say for VLAN 1, uh, sorry, for VLAN, yeah, VLAN 1, I should go to which port? So it can be received on the port 5. And if it received on the port 5, it should go to the port 1. So that's the reason I go to C. And the same goes if I receive from D. D will have a VID that is indicated through the port 3. So it's VID 2. So this guy, when he receives the frame from D, going to look at his table. And he's going to see that, oh, 2 needs to go to port 2. So that's the reason that we tag the, fr the frames okay, between two switches when you have a trunk between two switches, okay? Because you may receive multiple frames and a port may have multiple VLANs. Okay, guys. So just to summarize, and I'm very late, I'm sorry. So the switches are plug and play. They don't need any configuration. Uh, they separate the domain in multiple collision domains. So it means that one transmission in one domain doesn't create a collision in another one. It's Fast forwarding, because the only thing you do, you filter the frame based on the MAC address, 48 bits. That's what you need to map. And you don't need any mask or crazy things like the LPM in 
uh, IP topology. The problem is here we can only use trees, and the trees have a totally, uh, how do you say, uh, a route that is maybe not the optimal, and you still need to go all the way up to the roof to reach any destination. Uh, the tables, including the self-learning table or the R table, may get really big if your domain is large. You still need to have a very big table. And once again, you still need to do broadcast because art needs broadcast, because self-learning needs broadcast, because DHCP needs broadcast. And if your domain is very large, broadcast could be an issue in those networks. Okay, so that's the reason we said that VLANs may help. Okay, so as a conclusion, Ethernet is very easy to administer. We don't have addressing problems, nothing, it's plug and play. It's inexpensive. I mean, the technology that we use is very inexpensive. Uh, the speed that we can get have a very high throughput. I mean, nowadays we can reach like hundreds of gigabytes really easily. Uh, it moved from a bus to a star topology without changing the host. So that is totally transparent. So whether your host is connected to a star or to a bus, it doesn't make a difference for a host. The MAC address of a switch is unknown. It's totally transparent. Okay. We already said that if we have two buses, it's a bridge. If it's a star, this is a switch, but it's pretty much the same kind of devices. And we see that the technologies that we're using is self-learning, cut-through switching, if you don't want to buffer the whole frame, spanning tree, because you want to avoid cycles, and to uh, divide not only your domain in multiple collision domains, and you want also to divide the broadcast domain, you can use VLANs, but those are manual. All right, guys, so that's it. I'm so sorry for being four minutes late. I can still take questions, or if you don't have questions,